Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the argument, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So before we start, uh, Colin Graf is has to leave uh, because his teaching starts very soon. Uh, I'd like to thank Colin for working with me so hard and so successfully in organizing the program for this conference. So this was a really great pleasure, Colin, to work with you again. And we'll meet next year. Yes, yeah, this one here. So that's all. This Thanks, Colin. Does for this work? This one does. Uh, yeah. Yes, that works. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Colin. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got the last two talks of the week. First is by Phil Hopkins, when I talked about uh, cosmic rays. All right, thank you everyone for having me. Um, uh, very appropriate for a session on Cosmic Web and IGM. I'm gonna be talking about microparsec scales for about half of this talk. So uh, as Tom said, now for something completely different. Um, so Dushan introduced a lot of this yesterday, but I wanna just remind people, again, since some of you in this room haven't thought a lot about cosmic rays, but uh, these are relativistic particles uh, that we measure some energy spectrum for. And, uh, most of the energy density in cosmic rays, and therefore their pressure, and therefore their effects on large-scale galaxies, uh, are, around, are from protons at around a GeV energy, mildly relativistic protons. Um, and uh, from, uh, well, that's around the solar system, yeah. Uh, and then uh, in the local ISM, they're in rough pressure equilibrium with other terms, although they have a more extended scale height. Uh, they can... They do have losses. Sometimes people will say cosmic rays don't cool. That's wrong. Uh, but their cooling time in low density gas can be very long. Their energy loss time in dense gas can be quite short compared to the dynamical time. So they're not you know, somehow immune to energy losses. Uh, but they are interesting for that reason. And it's something like 10% of the energy in supernovae and much more uncertain, maybe of order of percent the energy in AGN goes into accelerating these particles. Now. Uh, you can write down a very general equation for what happens to a distribution of cosmic rays in, say, the interstellar or intergalactic medium. And uh, this took a few years of work uh, by different groups to figure out, kind of like how we had to figure out things like the mixed frame radiation transport equations. It took a little bit of iteration. But I think there's pretty broad consensus that this is the completely general term uh, equation governing the transport of a population of cosmic rays. Uh, uh, under almost any conditions. And the important thing isn't all these terms, it's that uh, essentially all of these terms depend on things that are either intrinsic to the cosmic rays or are macro properties that we can at least in principle uh, measure or predict, like the magnetic field or the density, except for one crucial term, uh, which is highlighted here. This is the cosmic ray scattering rate. Uh, if you want to take a radiation analogy, this is analogous to things like your opacities and scattering coefficients for radiation. Uh, the problem is, for radiation, we can measure that in the lab and predict it, and there's no analog of that from the cosmic rays. The way this scattering occurs is that as cosmic rays, because they're charged, are oscillating on gyro orbits around magnetic fields, fluctuations in the magnetic field lines essentially scatter the pitch angle of the cosmic rays. Basically, your cosmic ray is spinning, spiraling down a magnetic field in one direction. If there's kinks in the magnetic field, 
can effectively bounce off of that kink and move back in the opposite direction. And that's the scattering we refer to. And the problem is that the scattering occurs around the gyro, with fluctuations around the gyro radius of cosmic rays, which for these GeV cosmic rays in the ISM is like a tenth of an AU, a microparsec. So hopelessly unresolvable in our simulations and observations of the ISM. And just to, to be complete, when, when people talk about things like the effective diffusion coefficient or the streaming speeds of cosmic rays, these are all just sort of macroscopic functions of the scattering rate. The scattering rate is the fundamental quantity that we need to know. And basically our only tool to make even predictions for this thus far has been things like PIC simulations of cosmic rays and magnetic fields interact. This is some examples of a supernova shock uh, uh, PIC simulation. So how do we deal with this? Well, uh, we try and constrain it empirically. So the simplest thing you can do is just say I'm going to fit it to some completely phenomenological function. I'm just going to assume the scattering rate is some function of, say, the cosmic ray energy. Or here in the cosmic ray field, we use this variable rigidity, but it's just the momentum effectively of the cosmic rays. And there's many techniques you can use to constrain this. We just, if you just assume it's a power law with a couple of coefficients, some slope and normalization, uh, what's remarkable is actually in the last few years, there's been tremendous convergence in what these parameters need to be. We actually can very well empirically constrain this. And that comes from things like full cosmic ray MHD simulations, like I'll describe, uh, classic models of cosmic ray propagation in an analytic model for the galaxy. If you've heard of codes like GALPROP, that's what it's doing. It's taking a very simple analytic model for the galaxy and solving for the equilibrium distribution of cosmic rays. There's a new generation of semi-analytic models. There's new attempts to use gamma ray data independently. Uh, but these all actually give pretty consistent results. And you might notice there's a, these are tons of papers that come to consistent results. There's a huge uh, growth of the number of papers after 2016. And that, uh, is, that has to do with basically uh, a couple of things, most importantly, some, some AMS data releases, but all, most importantly, Voyager crossing the heliopause is what basically collapsed the uncertainties in these numbers uh, uh, and let us get here. So great. And just to show, uh, so how do you get those constraints? I won't go through this in detail. If you want to constrain your model, Dushan argued we really need to constrain these scattering rates to make predictions for what cosmic rays do. And we wanted to make sure we were as constrained as possible. And Dushan mentioned the gamma ray data extragalactically. But really, if you want to constrain the cosmic rays the way those models do, you need to model the whole spectrum and a bunch of different species of cosmic rays because they, different things uh, here in this plot do different things. So for example, the gamma ray spectra is dominated by the shape of the cosmic ray energy spectrum in these ranges for things like electrons or positrons and protons. Uh, ionization of molecular gas is dominated by low energy electrons. Uh, you, can get, you can model synchrotron spectra from high energy electrons and protons. Uh, you can model spallation products uh, at, as observed at the solar system or at Earth, uh, and radioactive products that are decaying on their way to us that give independent constraints. There's a whole industry and there's a lot you can get from this. So in order to, to do this, uh, we, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, integrated a lot of different numerical methods to build the first uh, code that could, in a live galaxy formation simulation, a live galaxy MHD simulation, not just evolve like our previous efforts and what much of Dushan described, some bin, some fluid that we just called the cosmic rays, but actually dynamically evolve the entire spectrum from MEV to TEV of a whole bunch of different cosmic ray species, including all their cross terms, et cetera. And you can then compare that to all these beautiful data uh, and uh, perhaps disappointingly, our conclusion was the, the old simpler models were pretty darn close to our favored best fit model after doing all this work, uh, although I still think it's valuable for reasons I'll come back to. Uh, and you can also compare to things like gamma rays from other galaxies, but also details like the gamma ray profile at different energies in the Milky Way as a function of galactocentric distance, as a function of vertical scale height, uh, ionization data in molecular clouds, et cetera, et cetera. And then here, Tushan showed a version of this as gamma ray data in nearby galaxies. This is sort of galaxy integrated gamma ray data that you can compare to. And you can show that for this is all using that reference uh, phenomenological model. You can fit all of this data beautifully, uh, I would argue, with, with that very simple model. So let's take that model and run with it. And again, Dushan already presented this, so I'm just going to remind you. If you take that model and run with it, cosmic rays can, in principle, have a big effect on galaxies. Uh, and uh, uh, especially in sort of Milky Way galaxies. As Dushan said, in dwarfs and high redshift galaxies, less so. 
But in Milky Way mass galaxies, you can in principle have a big effect suppressing the star formation from cosmic rays. And this is work, as he said, TK Chan did. Uh, also, Kung Yi Su has done the AGN extension of this. Uh, but this is sensitive to the transport parameters, the, the diffusion coefficient or the scattering rate. So uh, just for reference in this plot, the dotted line has no cosmic rays at all, it just completely ignores them. The white line is what happens if the cosmic rays diffuse too fast, aka they scatter too weakly in the ISM. So then they just escape the ISM and the CGM completely without doing anything. No surprise there, they don't do anything. But if you make their transport too slow, you over-confine them or they scatter too much in the ISM, then they get trapped in dense parts of the ISM, where, as I said, their losses are not negligible and they lose all of their energy. They cool fast like everything else tends to do in the ISM. And again, they end up having a very weak effect because they're only a small fraction of the supernova energy. It's this sort of sweet spot in the middle where they do a lot of work. Now, remarkably, that seems to coincide, perhaps not accidentally, with the favored observational scattering rates, where this seems to have a sort of maximal effect. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Uh, and again, as Dushan showed, the way this is actually happening is via the CGM. So what's happening is that the cosmic rays diffuse rapidly out of the ISM in these galaxies. And then in the CGM can do things like uh, re-accelerate galactic fountains into a larger scale galactic wind, support cool, diffuse uh, gas that would otherwise uh, cool rapidly and rain onto the galaxy if it was in thermal pressure equilibrium. And you see that, uh, so this is the same run without cosmic rays and with, this green is warm gas, there's a lot more warm, cool CGM gas. There's these outflows that Duchenne already showed that are prominent all the way out to megaparsec scales in some of the runs with cosmic rays where these blue lines show inflow in the run without cosmic rays. So there's a big effect here in the CGM uh, that, that we and many other groups have seen. And again, I'll just mention Kung Yi Su showed much the same for uh, cosmic rays from AGN coming out of the AGN jet uh, could be a very efficient quenching mechanism, sort of per unit energy, one of the most efficient mechanisms and potentially quench more gently than other mechanisms, which has been a challenge in trying to get AGN quenching models to match detailed observations of things like X-ray uh, entropy and density profiles in clusters. So this is great. Everybody should be doing cosmic rays in their simulations. They're hugely important. They're a game changer. Well, what's the problem? Well, fundamentally, the problem is all those constraints I showed you that anchor the model come from the ISM, right? They all come from the ISM, uh, either right around the sun or of galaxies not that different. And it's all dominated by their ISM. The gamma ray emissions all dominated by the ISM of those galaxies. So I just told you, though, that cosmic rays act primarily via the CGM. And this is the fundamental problem. So there's absolutely no reason to think from any physics model that the scattering rates of cosmic rays in the CGM are the same as in the ISM. And in fact, no theory model predicts they would be, because all the things that drive the scattering, the magnetic fields, the strengths of turbulence, the free electron densities, are very different in the CGM than in the ISM. And this directly translates to how much the cosmic rays can do. So this is a, an illustration of this. So on the left, this is just a cartoon of, imagine what the scattering rate as a, of cosmic rays is, does as a function of, cosmo, of galactic distance r. So you've got some anchor point with your ISM data. The models I showed are essentially assuming it's constant, right? So it's this green line. Uh, but you could also imagine a model where as the turbulence and magnetic fields get weaker, the cosmic rays scatter less and less and they decouple. So this rate plummets. Now the problem is, far from the galaxy where losses are pretty negligible, in steady state, the cosmic ray pressure, which is what's holding up the gas and doing all this work, is proportional to the cosmic ray energy density, which in steady state in a sphere is just proportional to the input divided by some flux, right? But the flux depends on the diffusion coefficient, depends on the scattering rate. So you get that the cosmic ray pressure in steady state is proportional to the scattering rate divided by R here in this simple spherical cow model. So that's this map to the right. So the constant diffusion, or sorry, constant scattering rate model corresponds to the cosmic ray pressure dropping very slowly as one over R. I drew for reference an isothermal sphere, one over R squared here, right? Not much drops as shallowly as one over R in the CGM, so you very quickly arrive at cosmic rays dominating the pressure and therefore doing a lot on the ambient medium. But of course, if it drops more rapidly, it could become irrelevant quickly in that outer medium. If the scattering rate drops, basically the cosmic rays will decouple and escape and their pressure will drop very rapidly. So 
We've tested this in practice with some very simplified toy models for how the cosmic ray scattering rate might depend on some uh, uh, properties like magnetic field or electron density or things like that. And what we found is we can get a lot of different answers. These are all models that are allowed in the sense that they are designed to match the same scattering rate values in the ISM, but extrapolate differently away from the ISM. We've anchored them all to have the same normalization in the ISM. And if you look at just the center plot, this is the fraction of the pressure as a function of radius in the CGM that they end up contributing. You can see it varies. And as a result, the star formation histories vary. And you can kind of get any answer in between the model where we ignored cosmic rays entirely or the model where we assumed a constant scattering rate. It turns out the constant scattering rate model is almost an upper limit of how much of an impact the cosmic rays can have. So what do we do when faced with this? Well, what we would normally do, at least what I would, what I would have first thought to do and did think first to do, uh, is say, well, okay, we don't have a lot of direct observations or really any direct observations in the CGM, but let's do the next best thing. We'll take a theoretical model for the scattering rate. We'll anchor it to the place where we have a lot of data in the ISM, because yeah, there's gonna be some fudge parameters in the model, some uncertainties. We'll calibrate the model to the ISM, and then we'll use it to extrapolate to the CGM. So we set out to try this exercise, and in a series of papers, but if you wanna see the details, there's a paper from last year that uh, uh, the referee described as uh, exhaustive if exhausting uh, to us, <laughs> that, that comprehensively goes through the fact that it turns out the models are uncalibratable. It's not that they don't work prima facie, it's that it is impossible to calibrate the theoretical models to the solar system data because there is no parameter that can be varied in the models that makes them even qualitatively look like the solar system cosmic ray data. And I could give a whole talk about this if this was a plasma physics audience, but I'm just gonna uh, try and very briefly explain. Uh, so there's basically all models that are widely used for how cosmic rays scatter can be grouped into two categories. One is the assumption that these magnetic fluctuations are part of some turbulent cascade in the ambient interstellar medium. Uh, and let's consider that case first. So if the fluctuations are part of a turbulent cascade, you can work out what the scattering rate would be. First, you get the answer that the normalization's wrong by a factor between a thousand and a million. But what's a factor of a million between friends? We're calibrating the model anyways. So let's normalize that out and recalibrate the normalization. Well, second, you get that uh, a bigger problem. Again, ignore exactly the details of these variables. You can show that uh, what this delta represents here, this is just a notation that's commonly used in the, the cosmic ray field, uh, is that one of the most robust and unavoidable conclusions from all of the cosmic ray data we have is that high energy cosmic rays scatter less and are less confined in the interstellar medium than low energy cosmic rays. So you need a scattering rate that's bigger at low energies, qualitatively. That is a very fundamental qualitative feature that is inescapable from the observations. You can actually show that for the known MHD equations, any alphanic or magnetosonic cascade cannot mathematically possibly produce that dependence. It is impossible to get that sign without changing the MHD equations, which we shouldn't do, I think. <laughs> uh, so there's something fundamentally wrong here. And some of these other papers, I should note, you know, this wasn't all pointed out for the first time in this. This is sort of a synthesis of, of pieces that have been collected. There's an extensive review by Sheko Sheehan, for example, that basically outlines exhaustively why none of the modifications to turbulence, doesn't matter what you want to say about intermittency or asymmetry or anisotropy, it's impossible. You can very generally prove that it's not possible. It, kinetic MHD doesn't work either. Uh, it's, it's generically true. If it's part of a cascade from much larger scales and you're below the damping scale of the magnetosonic modes, those are the technical conditions on it. So, uh, but, but those should be satisfied, in, and certainly by assumption in these models, those are satisfied. So, uh, uh, yeah, and that's, sorry, that's restated here for the fast modes. Uh, um, so there are ways around this, and I'll come back to that in a second potentially, but, but they're not things that have been considered thus far in the literature. Uh, so this, this class of models, and you can then plug, we even did the exercise, this paper is sort of half analytic where we go through analytic arguments of this. And then we just brute force try the models even after renormalizing them and show that you can't even get the right sign of half the, the scalings that you need to get. Uh, so they're very clearly ruled out. 
And then briefly, you have a very similar problem for the other school of models. So the other class of models that's widely talked about is what's called self-confinement. And that's the idea that these fluctuations that the cosmic rays bounce off of are excited by the cosmic rays themselves via instabilities as the cosmic rays stream down the magnetic field lines. And that model, again, has a normalization problem. It's only a factor of 100, which isn't so bad. Um, uh, uh, I'm not too worried, actually, about that. It also predicts the wrong spectral shapes, even after you renormalize the model of certain properties. But the real problem is, again, it is impossible to get this sign of the dependence of the scattering rate on energy. You can show, and in fact, uh, I thought I was clever by writing a proof of this, and then Roger Blanford pointed me to Cesarsky 71, who proved the same thing. Um, uh, but uh, you can show that in uh, the steady state cosmic ray energy density equation in this model, uh, has only two stable solutions. Either all cosmic rays stream at the exact same speed, which is the alphane speed, or all cosmic rays uh, escape at the speed of light. Those are the only two stable solutions of the energy density equation in this model, basically. Uh, so again, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in simulations. Uh, so where do we go from here? We don't have a theoretical model. So uh, I think we really need to, to start thinking outside the box. Because this could be really important, but we need to think about how we're going to go about this. So uh, I think there's two approaches you can take. Uh, uh, one, uh, which uh, we're trying to do some of, uh, I'll mention, is from the small scales up, come up with new plasma physics or microphysics ideas about what might actually be scattering the cosmic rays. Um, and there's been a lot of ideas about this. So there's other cosmic ray fluid interaction instabilities that are different from the one that traditionally drives self-confinement. Uh, there's interactions between cosmic rays and dust grains that I'll mention in a second. Uh, you can have uh, driving, if it's not part of a cascade from large scales, but it's locally driven by some in other instability, that avoids those constraints, I said, that, that kill all the, the, the turbulence models. The thing that kills them is the assumption that it's a coherent cascade from large scales, basically. Um, uh, but if you have some local small-scale driving, from microscale instabilities, that might be able to do it. Uh, there's also ideas about sort of punctuated scattering or scattering by very intermittent structures uh, in the ISM. Uh, but from galactic scales, we also want to come at this, and we care about, uh, you know, this clearly isn't going to be a solved problem from the plasma physics anytime immediately soon. Uh, so what can we do from large scales? Well, I think we need to you know, maybe do what we do best and come up with a bunch of new kinds of subgrid models and uh, see what they do. So. You can, of course, imagine just broadly parameterizing the scattering rate as some arbitrary function of these plasma parameters and then trying to make predictions for it. Not just explore their effects on galaxy formation, but make predictions for things like extended synchrotron halos, gamma ray halos around galaxies that start to probe the CGM and maybe let us at least start ruling out some of this model parameter space. And very briefly, I'll just mention there's some initial progress by some folks uh, uh, in our group or collaborators. Irina Butsky and Philip Kemsky have been working on this uh, punctuated scattering idea that you have sort of uh, the scattering not dominated by a bunch of small scatterings through a volume filling ISM or CGM, but that you encounter discrete structures that dominate the scattering. And that can really uh, change some of your inferences about how the scattering needs to scale. Um, so Ching Ji and now Uli Steinwandel have been looking at the interaction between cosmic rays and dust. Uh, that's been entirely ignored, uh, uh, basically, uh, in terms of the cosmic ray dynamics. But it's not necessarily a good assumption because it turns out, interesting coincidence, in the ISM and much of the CGM, the gyro radii of dust grains and the gyro radii of cosmic rays are about the same. Our charged dust gyrates around magnetic fields, so do cosmic rays. They have the same gyro radii. And with John O'Squire, we showed, and we've actually done simulations, uh, Dust has gyro resonant instabilities. Dust moving along magnetic fields excites instabilities that have resonances around the dust uh, gyro radius wavelength. Cosmic rays do the same. Those should crosstalk with each other if they're strongly resonant with the same scale. Uh, so, uh, so Ching's done some very preliminary, very preliminary work uh, to try and simulate these direct interactions between the two. Uh, in principle, uh, Jono. Uh, Squire and uh, So Ching showed that it could either lead to faster or slower cosmic ray escape, more or less scattering, depending on 
your assumptions. So we need to explore the models in more detail, but, but uh, so Ching showed at least in principle by doing some MHD PIC simulations uh, that this is just a map that's meant to show both the B field strength and the dust density, uh, kind of a proof of concept that you could do this, they could strongly interact. Uh, but really more a motivation to do more work. Um, we're also trying to think of new observations. Arena's finishing up a paper on new observational constraints, new ways to set uh, uh, upper limits on the scattering rate or equivalently lower limits on the diffu diffusivity in the CGM. Uh, another student, Sam Panada, with a postdoc, Gina Panopoulou, have been making things like extended synchrotron maps around galaxies. This is more a face-on image of an actual galaxy, uh, but their idea is to look at things like synchrotron scale heights as a function of wavelength around nearby galaxies and see if we can uh, get information out of that. And that's where we're still hoping these full spectrum models will be very valuable because it lets us predict details of the synchrotron properties and try and get new constraints on this. So uh, cosmic rays could be crucial, but it depends crucially on the scattering rate and we don't have any data where the scattering rate matters. So we really need to think about how we're approaching this and, and explore new approaches and new constraints. And I think our best hope might be these indirect constraints. Now I'll use one or two minutes to just show, before I jump back to the conclusions, uh, a completely different thing, which is an advertisement for a couple of students who are going to be applying for postdocs in the fall. I didn't get to talk about any of this, but I wanted to mention uh, Jacob Shen. Uh, Shui Jian Shen uh, is a student who's uh, 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 planning on defending this year, who's worked primarily on exploring the effects of different dark matter physics on observables. And uh, uh, as you can see here, these are all papers he's worked on on different topics. And these are just a random selection of figures from those. But uh, as you can guess, if you even scan this, he's worked on a huge array of different types of dark matter models. And I think that's pretty impressive, not just in how prolific he's been, but that he's really thought about a wide variety of different types of particle physics motivated dark matter models, things like axions and uh, composite dark matter models, dissipative models, atomic or mirror dark matter, Bose-Einstein condensate models, uh, a lot of different models for dark matter and a wide range of different constraints ranging from things that people in this room are used to thinking about like galaxy rotation curves and sizes, but also through things like uh, you know, microlensing, uh, observability in pulsar timing arrays from structures that you get from early matter domination models, and a lot of other ways of coming at the dark matter problem. Uh, so I think uh, I've frankly never seen a graduate student who's so uh, broad in terms of the scope of, of particle dark matter models they've worked on. And I just, if you're curious about any of this, please check out some of his papers. Um, and then I'll also advertise another student, Yan Lung Shi. Uh, who's going to be defending the fall, who's also worked on a broad range of topics. I'm only advertising a couple of his papers here. He's also worked on some cosmology projects with Olivier Doré uh, and some planet formation projects with uh, Jim Fuller. Uh, with me, he's worked on a couple projects on intermediate mass black hole formation, either via runaway stellar mergers in the centers of extremely dense, massive protoclusters, showing that uh, the runaway is sort of more viable than a lot of previous n-body models thought because of the fact that they ignored uh, non-equilibrium effects in the early cluster uh, phase space distribution. Uh, and he's also about to publish a second paper on uh, basically can hyper-Eddington accretion happen for small 1 to 100 solar mass black holes in very dense gaseous environments like galactic nuclei and things like that. And the punchline is, yes, it can. Uh, so uh, those were just a couple quick advertisements. I'll leave my conclusions up and thank you very much. Here. Thanks so much. Um, this is just to make sure that I understand uh, a lot of what was said. So the problem with the theoretical models about the cosmic ray scattering being dominated either by extrinsic turbulence or the self-confinement, both of those processes are happening. You're just saying that they can't be what's dominating the scattering. Yes, exactly, yes. Okay. That's, that's, yes, exactly right. And. Uh, for the extrinsic turbulence, it's actually very easy to assume it's not dominating because there, when I said the normalization is wrong by a factor of up to a million, it's, it's wrong in the sense that it predicts much too weak a scattering. So actually, if we didn't mess with it, it would automatically not dominate. Uh, the self-confinement's a little trickier because it seems to actually over-confine them, and you not only need it to not over-confine them, but also to not dominate. There's been some work by um, Schwening Bai that's argued that 
the sort of naive linear theory estimate could be at least an order of magnitude, an overestimate of how aggressively that, that particular instability grows, which goes in the right direction towards it not being dominant. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's a subtle but important part of the puzzle there, yeah. Thanks. Any other question? Yep. Uh, so in case of dust, cosmic ray scattering, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the nice coincidence that they have similar gyro radii. Mm -hmm. um, but the gyro frequencies would be extremely different. Yeah. Um, do, do they still interact uh, having completely different time scales? Yes, so the, it turns out not only are the, so you're right that the, the gyro frequencies are wildly different. The gyro radii are similar. Uh, the interesting thing is that the, the sort of resonant instabilities both involve the wavelength, not the, the gyro frequency, and the growth rates actually end up being fairly similar. The linear growth rates of those instabilities are similar to each other. Numerically, this is an awful thing that they have such different gyro frequencies because you have to take, if you want to simulate them on the fly, you have to do, you know, 10 million time steps for your cosmic ray for every one time step for your dust grain, basically. Uh, so that's actually why, when I mentioned the one simulation So Ching published, and I was trying to really caveat as a proof of concept, we picked some really extreme parameters just to make it computationally feasible to do the simulation and integrate it for a, a you know, significant number of growth times of the relevant instabilities. It's very much not uh, the parameters that would represent like the warm ionized medium or something like that. Um, I think that's a real computational challenge but worth thinking about how to do it better. There are plasma physics techniques, I was talking a little with Tom about it, that let you do things like you know, average over gyro orbits for the faster species. And so people have dealt with this in the PIC literature with other ratios of different species, for example. So uh, I'm just learning that literature myself. Okay, more questions? Yes, Sergeant. Uh, maybe you can say a few words about what 